you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon Hill? How you doing today? Isn't that great worship, man? Um, look, it's good to be back. Uh, it is good to be back home. I missed y'all, although we had a great time in Haiti. Uh, thank you for praying for our team that was in Haiti. We got to see God do some amazing things. Our, our purpose of the trip was like a vision trip, and we got to um, do some medical missions, and we were only did two days uh, on the ground of seeing people, and in two days of being there, we saw 320 patients and were able to give them free medicine, um, thankfully to y'all's um, donations and offering, and we're thankful for that. We got to speak in a seminary class. Uh, we got to uh, go to the hospital, and actually we heard of an orphan down there in the hospital. We were able to give them diapers and uh, clothing donated by our own very local pregnancy help center of Chesterfield County. And we got to see six people come to Christ. It was a great, great, great um, time. So uh, people, people were like, why are y'all coming to Haiti? Don't you know it's dangerous? And I was like, you haven't read about Hopewell. So we are not a church that likes to minister in the comfort zone. We are a church that likes to get uncomfortable um, and let God use us. But if you want to know a little bit more about Haiti and our mission, take one of our people out that went. Um, on the trip and let them share with you what God did. You can start by taking me out to eat as long as you're paying. I would love to get a chance to do that. Look, uh, if you're a guest with us today, thank you for being here. I pray that you've been welcomed by our Beacon Hill family already. If I haven't got a chance to meet you, please stop by. I'd love to get a chance just to thank you for being here personally today and see how we can pray for you and uh, man and, and get you to be part of what God is doing here in the well. Beacon Hill, uh, when we try to describe our church, it's, it's kind of hard if you've been around other churches to describe us, but we try as as much as possible to be like the early church. We try to live life together. We try to study the word together and we want to worship together and we want to make an impact in the community together. So we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And it's that Jesus I want to preach to you today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, open them up with me to Matthew chapter three, Matthew chapter three, where I'll be Focusing on verses 13 through 17 this morning, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hands and one of our Beacon Hill team members will bring you a copy uh, for you to have. We believe strongly in having the Word of God open as it is preached, and so I want you to see where I'm getting what I am preaching. I'd also like to welcome our online viewers. Uh, we have a, a great um, online following, and we're so thankful for you. Uh, when we were in Haiti, I was, uh, we were introducing ourselves to people, and uh, this one guy goes, uh, I know you. And I'm like, how can you know me, right? You know, I've never been to this part of Haiti. And he goes, we watch your service every week online. And I'm like, so you're the guy who watches. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, but, but so welcome to our friends in Haiti. We're so thankful that you're here. And uh, if you're a, a regular here at Beacon Hill, you know what's next. Get on your feet as we read the Word of God. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. The Word of God says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus answered him, allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. Then the heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much um, just to be able to be here today. Uh, Lord, I, you know, what I've experienced and what I've seen in the last two weeks, um, just being out the country, and um, man, there's so many people that don't have the blessings of being here in, in a place like we are today, to be able to worship you. Um, Lord, I've seen kids walk three miles to get, get some water. Shouldn't be like that. Lord, you've given us the message of reconciliation. You've given us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for every single person in this church to be the church, to go out into their mission field and share the love of Jesus. People want to see Jesus in us before they hear Jesus from us. And Lord, I pray this morning, 
uh, that if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, as I just preached a funeral yesterday of a lifelong friend, I'm just reminded of how brief this life is. And so, Lord, if someone is here today and they're hearing me right now, and they don't know for sure where they're going to be spending eternity, may they not leave here today without being 100% sure that they will be spending eternity with you in heaven. Lord, speak through me now, your servant. Empty me of anything uh, of my own and fill me up with the Holy Spirit. Be with the hearers of this message. Convict their hearts and send them out to be used for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I have entitled today's message, Going Public with Your Ministry. Going public with your ministry. When you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you do not see much about Jesus' early years. You see a couple of um, Gospels, Matthew and Luke, where they record the birth of Jesus, and then Luke goes more into detail talking about the circumcision of Jesus. I told Pastor Jafar that he was going to be performing circumcisions next week for us here at Beacon Hill. That's the job of the associate pastor. Um, But Luke chapter 2, verse 40, uh, gives the most extensive talk of Jesus' childhood. It's extensive too. So you look at Luke 2, chapter 40, it gives the most extensive talk of Jesus' childhood up to the age of 12. Let me read it for you. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. That's it. That's all we know from the circumcision until T turns 12. That's all we know about the, the, the childhood, the early years of Jesus until we get to 12, and it's actually one of my, man, it's one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. Jesus' parents lose him. Like, how do you, have you ever lost a child before? Like, it's one of the most scary things in your life, right? Twice? Yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, the first one you're worried about, the second one, like, well, whatever, they come on, they come on. Yeah, whatever, you know, they'll make it, right? But I remember getting lost in Kmart in Petersburg as a kid, and my parents, my, my mom, man, she, if y'all know my mom, she's an overprotective parent. And so she went into complete freakout zone in Kmart. So she told the managers to lock all the doors. She made sure the cashiers had their arms over the door. No one was going out until she found her son. And then she heard the fire alarm, and she goes, that's my son with whom I am not pleased right now, right? So, so she knew it, right? But in, in the Gospels, and, and Jesus got lost. How do you lose Jesus, right? I mean, if anybody would ever have one of those leashes, child leashes on them, it would be Jesus. But they lost him. And so that is what we see. And that's all we hear about Jesus until he turns 30, around 30, and he gets baptized. That's where all four Gospels start to talk about the baptism of Jesus. And this is when his earthly ministry goes public. So for 30 years, he had spent largely in private, growing, and getting ready for his public ministry. And now, when we study this text, this time has arrived for Jesus to start his public ministry. Now, we're not a typical sermon church. Uh, we are an expository church, which means we don't, we don't try to add to a text what the text does not say. So if you're doing a topical sermon, we could go into everything about baptism just because it says baptism in the text. But we are left with a lot of things about baptism that is not mentioned. Like, for instance, should you uh, be sprinkled or should you be dunked? That's not mentioned in this passage. But when you look at Acts... You should understand that we're not like the Methodists who sprinkle. We're like the Baptists who dunk. In other words, it's kind of like my donuts. I like them fully dipped, (laughs) not sprinkled. You understand? So we see this as we look into this passage. So look, when we look look at this passage, we have to pull out. And I got to tell you, this was tough. This took a lot of studying. We got to say, God, what, what are you trying to tell us in this text? What are you trying to, to, for us to, to grab and, and, and to learn from this text? And, and how are the applications that we need to take away from this? And so I want us to study this together today. 
within the context of the scriptures. And the first thing that we see, that I believe we see in verses 13 through the beginning of 15a, is that this text points to the ministry of Jesus beginning with him looking towards the end of his ministry. We see Jesus beginning his ministry by looking towards the cross. The word says, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus answered him, allow it for now. In case you've never been to one of our baptisms here, we baptize in a horse trough. And I think on one of our best days of baptisms, I think we baptize like seven to ten in one day. Uh, and that's, a, that's an awesome day, isn't it? And uh, so but when you look at John the Baptist, uh, man, they had people coming from all around to be baptized by him. So he, he baptized way, way, way more than 10 people in a day. So we can only relate, um, but so much. But imagine on the day that we had like seven to 10 people getting baptized. And I get after the fifth person and I'm like, all right, next. And I look up and it's Jesus. Yeah, well, how would, that would be wild, right? That'd be, what, what would you, re, how would you react if Jesus was in line to get baptized? Like you can understand John the Baptist, like, kind of freaking out, right? Whoa, you're not going to do that. Like, in Michael's speak, if I, was, if I was sitting there and I saw Jesus in line, I would jump in the horse trough and go, I'm ready, Jesus, baptize me. You know, you can certainly understand how he is confused here, right? So, and some people didn't know, some people didn't know that that was Jesus. But John the Baptist has been talking about Jesus. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one coming after me is more powerful than I, and I'm not even worthy to remove his sandals. And now Jesus is in line to be baptized by him. It must have been an awesome, awesome moment for John the Baptist, do you reckon? So he's sitting here, and we're seeing this. You can understand that he's confused, too. He's confused because he was doing a baptism of repentance for people's sins, and he knew that Jesus had no sin. He's the sinless Savior. 1 Peter 2.22 says he did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And John recognized his own imperfections. He understood that he was a sinner and he needed to be in that baptism pool and not Jesus. You can understand him being perplexed, right? Why does Jesus get baptized? You ever thought about why did Jesus get baptized? So we see the uniqueness of Jesus' baptism. It wasn't a baptism of repentance as John was doing. And it's not the Christian baptism as we see today. It's very unique. And I believe what was happening was, I believe that Jesus chose being baptized to begin his ministry, to look forward to the end of his ministry. Because his baptism pictures his future baptism on the cross when all the waves and billows of God's judgment would go over him. When he would cry out on that cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And with that, he gave up his spirit, church. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He started his earthly ministry realizing how his earthly ministry would end, church. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for you and I. While John said, hold up, Jesus, hold up, I, you don't need to be, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus said to John, let it happen. There are going to be a lot of people. There are going to be a lot of people in the next three years to try to stop what I was born to do, what, what I came to do. But I must do what God the Father sent me to do, and that is to give my life up on the cross as a propitiation for the sins of the world, that whosoever shall believe in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he was getting baptized, church. Secondly, we see the reason that Jesus got baptized. It says it in Scripture, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus identified with the people he came to save. The Word says Jesus answered him, saying, Allow it for now, because this is the way to fulfill 
all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. To fulfill all righteousness means to complete everything that forms part of a relationship of obedience to God the Father. Jesus' baptism would not only give a stamp of approval to John's baptism of repentance, but also identify himself with the sinners, the publicans, the very people he came to save. Jesus didn't sidestep anything in his ministry. He came to fulfill it completely, church. He wasn't going to ask others to do what he didn't do himself first, church. When you come to Christ, your first act of obedience is to follow him in believer's baptism. I often say, if you choose not to get baptized, that's actually your first act of disobedience to God. Why? Because it's his command. He says to make disciples and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're here today and you have never followed through with believer's baptism, may you take that next step of faith in your walk with Jesus. While baptism doesn't save you, it's a way for you to identify with what Jesus did for you on the cross. Just as Jesus took our sins and gave his life, for us and conquered the grave on the 33rd day, we get baptized. We are saying, gone with the old, behold, the new has come. Jesus was baptized. Why do you think you don't have to? Thirdly, Jesus' ministry was approved by his father. We see this in verses 16 through 17. It says, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. This sermon, these verses in this, in this text can be whole sermons in itself. It's one of the few places in Scripture where we see the whole Trinity in one place. It's a beautiful thing to see. Jesus comes out of the water, and he saw the Spirit of God like a dove descend on him. The Spirit is not in bodily form. That's why it uses terms like like, because it is undescribable. But when you look through the book of Acts, if, you're just, if, if anybody's going through Acts in their quiet time, Read through the book of Acts. You will see a very close connection through baptism and receiving of the Holy Spirit. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives with inside of you. The Holy Spirit is a helper to guide you through your new life in Jesus. We witnessed to a man in Haiti, in the villages of Haiti, and, and we were talking to him about giving his life to Christ and it was a really great moment, and, and I always encourage y'all just to have gospel conversations and just to listen to people. And as we listened to him, he said, you know, I want to follow this Jesus that you talked to me about today. But he said, I still have anger in my heart. He said, I have anger in my heart towards my aunt, and I won't respond to what I told him immediately after that, Lauren. But, uh, but I said, come to Christ as you are and let him deal with the anger in your heart. When you come to Christ, you come to Christ imperfect. We are imperfect people. We are broken people. Some people say, I'm going to come, but I've got some things to work on today. Guess what? You can't work on them without Jesus. You can't have them cleaned up without Jesus. Come to Christ and let him deal with your imperfections in your life. Are you with me here this morning, or do you need Pastor Jan back in here to encourage you? Look, maybe you're here today. And, and, and you're, you're waiting for some reason to have you come up with in your head to come to Christ. I need to do this. I need to do this. I'm telling you, come to Christ as you are today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, but today. Give your life to Christ today. Are you with me? Give your life to Christ today. Not only did the Spirit of God come and rest on him, but a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The father's statement of approval, what Jesus had done up to that point, his early years, everything that he'd done, the, the father is putting his stamp of approval on what his son is doing. 
What an encouragement it must have been to hear his father say, I am pleased. I don't know about you, but my father's gone on to glory. And I always wanted to please my earthly fathers. Anybody else in here with me? I wanted to try to do things to earn his approval. And I wanted to be the best I could at sports. I, I longed to hear my earthly father say, good job. But infinitely more, I longed to hear my heavenly father say, good job. I am well pleased with you. I pray that God is pleased with how well I serve him. And guess what? I don't serve God. I, I, don't, I don't go to Haiti. I don't, I don't go to Five Forks. I don't do those things to earn God's love. I go into those places because I have God's love inside of me. That's why we go, church. So I want to wrap up this message with 27 applications. Now, now there's, there's, some, there's some applications in here we got to see. And I think this is so important. The first application that I want us to really grasp today, because I, we didn't come, when we came to, to Hopewell, Virginia, people would say, why are you starting a church in Hopewell? There's churches all over the place. Have you ever heard that? There's too many churches already. We don't need to come and have another church. We didn't come to Hopewell to be another church. We came to Hopewell to be the church. That's why we're here. And so the first application that I want you to take home with you today and, and, and put into your heart is that our ministry has a shelf life to it, church. Our ministry has a shelf life. Like our food ministry is bumping. Can I use that term? Is that okay, Dixons? All right, y'all are young ones. All right, bumping. Y'all know what that is? You want to explain it to your mom? All right, good. Look, here we go. We are getting tons of food. We're getting tons of food every week into our food ministry. And just this past week, we were able to expand into five forks just because of how much God is blessing us with food. But here's the deal with the food that we get. It is at or near its expiration date. And we know that because I test all the sweets that come in <laughs> before they go out. No, we, it helps. But we know this because they have an expiration date stamped on the food. And we know that we have to get it out into the hands of the people that need it before it goes bad. Are, are you tracking with me this morning? I hope you are. Because look, I, our, our ministry has an expiration date on it. Our ministry has a date where God has already stamped when our ministry is going to end. But why we, we can't read it, God knows the date that he has stamped on it. And I don't know about you, I want to get out the message that God has given us as quick as possible to as many people as possible while I am still here. Are you with me? I don't want it to go bad. I want to use every day for God's glory. May we live our lives with the expectation and understanding that we are only here for so long. Some people will, will, will use an excuse. Like, we, we, can't, we can't sit around. We can't sit around any longer. When I look at poor Paris who, who, who got, got killed on New Year's Day, I look at the murder that we had last Monday. When I look at all this, we can't sit anymore. We got to get the gospel into the hands of the people who need it. We got the message that has changed our life. How much do we have to hate people to not share the, the message that can change and save their life as well, church? Some people will go, you know what? I, I don't know what my ministry is. I'm sitting here, I'm going to pray about what my ministry is. I don't know enough. Yet I'm going to learn more. I want to learn more before I go out there. I need to know more. You know the only thing that you need to know? Is that Jesus saves sinners. Jesus saves sinners. If Jesus has saved your life, he can save anybody's life in here. As you serve him, as you get out on the streets, and as you serve him actively, God will develop in you. He will grow you and use you for his glory. Because there will be a day, 
There will be a day when your ministry will come to an end. Will you be able to say that you fulfilled your ministry and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, or will you squander the time that God has given you? Because one of the things, and you're like, well, where did you get this from, Pastor, in this text? One of the things that goes largely unnoticed in this passage is the intersection of John's ministry with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When you look at this text, John's ministry will kind of fade into the background and he will get arrested as, I don't want to give a suspense out in what next week's chapter says, but he's going to get arrested. And his ministry is going to kind of fade into the background. And that should be an encouragement to us. Some of us are like, how is that an encouragement that our ministry is going to be in the background? It should be an encouragement to you because Jesus' ministry will keep on going long after yours is done. I, 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 I don't know, it's a little pet peeve of mine. Um, when I go around and I see churches with the, uh, with the pastor's name and a plaque outside on a brick wall and everything, and I, I know they mean well, but I don't care if anybody ever remembers me as long as they remember the person that I preached, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's all that matters, church. It doesn't matter anything else in your life. Nothing else matters in this life if you don't know Jesus. So, first thing I want you to know is that your ministry has a shelf life. The second thing I want you to, to take away is that you and I need to set the example. Jesus set the example of getting baptized even though he didn't need to. He, he wanted to identify with the very people that he came to save. You and I can't sit on the sidelines. We can't just comment on Facebook every time there's another violent act in Hopewell and say, oh, we got to do something. You know what? We are the ones that God has called to do something. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. You want change in Hopewell, you've got to be the change. Maybe God is calling you today to set the example by getting up out of your, your seats and helping us on the streets. Maybe God is calling you today to set the example by giving your life to Christ and following through with believers' baptism. Maybe God is calling you today to set the example with celebrate recovery and just being in attendance and encouraging other people to come and let God heal their hurts as well. One thing for sure is that God has called each and every one of us that is a believer here today. And if God saved you, he is sending you, church. The question are, where are you sent? You're sent out into your mission field, wherever that is. Whether or not it's a school system, whether or not it's Five Forks or here in the parking lot. God has sent you, and we are called to set the example. The last thing I want to share with you this morning as the band comes up and we play God the City again, is that you kind of keep your eyes on the cross. Keep your eyes on the cross. Jesus never forgot what was ahead of him. He knew the pain and suffering that would occur. He knew that on Friday it was going to be bleak, but he also knew that Sunday was going to be on fleet church. He kept his eyes on the cross. He was faithful every step of the way. You know what? You and I are going to have ups and downs in our ministry. We're going to have ups and downs in our life. We have, we're going to have things that are set back. We're going to have things that are going to discourage us, but I want you to keep your eyes eyes on the cross and keep on walking to the cross and setting the example and trusting Jesus even when it's hard to do so, church. So I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. I'm going to pray, and if this is your first time here, we have a time of response. If you've never given your life to Jesus, this is a time for you to give your life to Jesus. You don't even know what that means. That's all right. We'll, we'll tell you. We'll take you in the back, and we'll share with you what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've got some type of hurt in your life, something you're going through, a family member that's sick and you just need prayer for them. That's what we're here for. Maybe you want to be a part of the change in Hopewell. Come down, let's pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for being a God who loves us, who never leaves us nor forsakes us, a God who is always with us. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the blessings of being able to just be back here in my home, just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, I know that my ministry has a shelf life. And I'm determined to preach Jesus Christ every day of that shelf life I have left. And Lord, I pray right now somebody just is hearing these words and they would get the encouragement to get out of their seats and come forth and give their life to you. And I can assure you, you will never regret it. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and respond to the word of God.